everyone, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, so we are V-Link, um, and welcome to the Transforming Food Production webinar. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, this is our next live event. My name is Julia Henson, and I'm the Communications and Events Manager here at V-Link, and I'll be your host for this event. Uh, so we're V-Link Innovation, part of Lincoln University. We specialise in the facilitation of innovative ideas, not only in Canterbury, uh, but around the nation. Our workshop space is located in the heart of Lincoln University, uh, where our events would normally be held. Um, and, and I guess in light of recent events, we have pivoted to a virtual event, but we're really hoping to return back to our workshop space so we can treat you all with a wine and some nibbles for our next live event. Um, so normally we hold events uh, primarily focused around innovative solutions and inspiring people at Farmgate, industry and academia. One of our main points of difference is a far reaching audience and a collaborative nature to ensure that New Zealand has the best possible outcomes in terms of environmental sustainability and native efficiencies. So just onto a little bit of housekeeping before we get started this afternoon, this webinar will be recorded um, and sent out to you after the event. So this means that you can actually spend time listening to every speaker tonight, rather than feverishly taking notes and, and making sure that you've jotted everything down. There will be a Q&A session following our speaker, uh, Dr. Newcomb, so please use our Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, uh, rather than the live chat function. Um, so those Q&As we can then pose on your behalf. There is a thumbs up button next to each of those questions. Uh, so the more each question is upvoted, the more the question will be prioritised and hopefully we'll get around to answering a few of those questions. So normally our Vibe series gives participants a way to connect with each other over a beverage, like I said, but on our current format, networking is a little bit tricky. Uh, we've had some feedback from our previous live event to facilitate virtual networking um, via Zoom. In light of that, I'm encouraging participants to do a chat to connect via the live chat. So feel free to put a link uh, to your LinkedIn page along with specific details of what you'd like to connect about. Vice versa, if you find someone's post on live chat has sparked your interest, feel free to connect with them that way. The live chat function will be moderated and we can't take any responsibility for any spammy connections. So please reach out if it's only relevant. And as a default, all participants are muted and all webcams are switched off. So don't worry, we can't see or hear anyone at the moment. So let's get social. If you see or hear anything that you'd like to share or you're just purely interested by, please do not forget to mention us with our handles on the screen at the moment. We wanna make sure our events and the ideas that come out of them are as far reaching as possible. So please do get social. So without further ado, please let me introduce you to uh, Dr. Richard Newcomb. Dr. Newcomb is currently the Chief Scientist at New Zealand's Institute for Plant and Food Research, as well as a Professor of Evolutionary Genetics at the University of Auckland. Richard is an Associate Editor for the Journal of Chemical Ecology, has been on granting panels for the Marsden Fund and FRST, and is New Zealand's representative on the Committee at the Genetic Society of Australasia and the Australasian Association of Chemosensory Sciences. Richard has served on delegations of New Zealand scientists to the US uh, and Taiwan, been a visiting fellow at CSIRO and Yale University, and has been an invited speaker to numerous international conferences. Richard is an investigator at two New Zealand centres for research excellence, as a principal investigator at the Alan Wilson Centre for Molecular Evolution and Ecology, and as an associate investigator at the Morris Wilson Centre for Molecular Biodiscovery. It's a real pleasure, and I'm very excited to introduce you. Uh, over to you, Dr. Newcomb. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Julia, for that introduction. Um, Tanakoto, everyone. Um, I'll just get the technology working for me and go to, and we'll get underway. Let's have a look here. I've just got to get this screen to. Okay. 
So today I'm going to give a, a warm up on the topic of transforming food production in New Zealand. I'm going to try and be brief, so there's plenty of time for um, Q&A at the end of this. So take this first part as a bit of a warm up. It sort of comes in three sections. I'm going to um, talk a little bit about the context um, around food production at the moment. I'm then going to um, give a brief introduction to plant and food research because that um, gives a bit of context to uh, the next part of the talk, which is um, what I see the ways that plant and food can contribute to uh, uh, issues around uh, food production in the here and now, and also the more transformational um, food production changes that probably need to occur in the longer term and things that we're contributing to. So first, the context piece. I'm sure you've all seen this. This is the 17 uh, SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. And th this has become very important, I think, internationally, is um, setting up the challenges that we all face um, on, on the planet that we live in and giving some kind of um, something for us all to strive for and also to to see where we can all play our part in, in, in transforming the world, um, both environmentally uh, and also socially, to one that um, we want to live in. Um, so so the, uh, the New Zealand government signed up to these SDGs, and so they're, uh, um, they're, just, they're not just something that we can think of were conceived somewhere else in the world, and we don't really have to uh, acknowledge them or work towards them, but we have actually signed up to them. So uh, I quite like the fact that we now have these challenges to work towards. Um, the New Zealand government's not only signed up to some of these challenges, but they're actually um, putting into legislation um, some goals, some specific goals for New Zealand and New Zealand industry um, to strive towards. And they're going to create some um, real change within, within New Zealand and uh, within New Zealand businesses. And here we've got a target of uh, carbon zero, which has recently been signed off as a piece of legislation. And we can see that's going to impact the agricultural sector um, because if they if that joins into this target then we have quite a bit of work to do here with half the um, emissions being accountable through to agriculture of course other kinds of industry uh, energy and transport also have um, big contributions um, to uh, to greenhouse gas emissions as well, so they're also an important part of this equation. But um, this is this aligns with some of the SDG goals, and so there'll presumably be other bits of legislation that will help us, uh, the New, or at least the New Zealand part of that uh, uh, challenge will be addressed by individual pieces of legislation. And if I come right down to um, what I think is part of our challenge in New Zealand, it's um, probably to feed the extra 2.5 billion mouths that we're going to have joining us on this planet over the next um, 30 years. Um, so within 20, by 2050, 68% of the um, well, world's people are going to be living in the city, so uh, living in cities. So most of those extra 2.5 million people are probably going to be living in cities. New Zealand already feeds a lot of um, urban urban dwellers, um, especially in Asia. Um, we have to remember that uh, we produce enough food to feed about 40 million people. Um, so the New Zealand part of that equation is only a, a, a small fraction of the, the, the number that we can feed, only being 5 million people, although it seems to be increasing rapidly every day. So um, much of that food um, goes up into Asia and most of those cities um, that are expanding rapidly are in Asia rather than in Europe or in Africa, which is not urbanizing at the same rate. So really for us, it's understanding what those urban consumers um, want and what they're prepared to pay a premium for. So if you like, I mean, I see these as some of the challenges that we face when we're looking at designing our food production systems and what food we should be producing here. The other piece of the puzzle is some of the other trends that are going on um, within the world agri-food system. Um, and the big change for me that's happened over the last five years is that sustainability has now become um, not just something that governments and regulators are concerned about um, uh, and growers, but more importantly that consumers are now very interested in to make sure that their food is not only, um, uh, you know, 
tastes good and is good for them, but is also um, um, traveling with the lightest footprint it can on the planet. Um, the other, obviously the other big uh, trends that we're seeing are things like climate change now beginning to be felt, uh, and that's having an impact, and uh, that will be returned to later in the talk. Um, consumers um, are still wanting to um, and, uh, experience foods that delight them and are convenient for them in their increasingly busy lifestyles. Convenience is becoming an important characteristic of food. Um, even though they're concerned about health as well, we still haven't found any kind of silver bullets out there, but there are certainly foods with health halos, and we would like some of our foods to be included in those halos. Another big change that's happened over recent years is that is that with the advent of um, big data and machine learning, we're seeing that increasingly applied to problems in agriculture. Um, uh, and in fact, Silicon Valley now has discovered that they can um, help with agricultural issues as well and have, have pivoted towards agriculture as being another market they can supply into. So we're starting to see uh, some of that uh, as well with uh, interventions and um, uh, data being collected, analysed and applied to management decisions within agriculture. Uh, and finally there we've got the microbiome which um, uh, we have now discovered is not only a big impact on human health but it's also an important part of the health of soils and our food production systems as well in the environment. So um, we're starting to learn about that microbiome and how we can manipulate it uh, to our advantage to either um, enhance plant growth or perhaps um, uh, protect plants against pathogens. Um, just as well as those international trends, there are some things that we probably need to be cognizant of that are peculiar to New Zealand. Um, the first one of those I've got there on the list is uh, biosecurity. Um, biosecurity is peculiar to us because we are a, an island nation, um, thousands of miles from the next la land mass of any consequence. So we can actually uh, use that to our advantage to keep pests and pathogens out. And in fact, a lot of the crops that we grow here and animals that we, um, uh, uh, that, that we rear here are um, uh, from other countries. And so we've kind of escaped their pests and pathogens and are now in the, in the process of defending our borders to keep them out. Um, and the, those pressures with increased transportation between different countries is only um, increasing the, pre, the, uh, the issue of biosecurity for us to keep protecting our, our borders. Um, gene technology is, uh, is an interesting um, debate which I'll turn to at the end of the talk again, um, where it's overseas we've seen the development of gene editing technology um, and um, New Zealand's going through a process of, very, or of considering how to use that technology um, and we've seen overseas, we've seen that technology um, uh, dealt with by different regulators in different countries in very different ways from Europe on one end of a spectrum right through to the US and other countries on the other end of the spectrum and Australia in the middle of that spectrum and I think New Zealand's probably going to um and ah about where it wants to sit on that spectrum at the moment we're sitting at the European end of that uh, regulatory spectrum. The other thing peculiar to New Zealand is that we have uh, indigenous people that have um, benefited for some um, through some recompense through the Waitangi Tribunal system which has uh, empowered them to uh, develop their own economy of scale um, unparalleled around indigenous people anywhere in the world and in this in the primary sector some of those primary sectors including seafood um, and increasingly others such as horticulture they are a major force now and own large parts of those sectors so that's a very interesting dynamic again which we can turn to to how we can use that to our advantage in New Zealand. Uh, the other thing that's peculiar to New Zealand is that we've seen social license have dramatic effects, or at least the loss of social license have dramatic effect to some of our primary sectors. You've only got to look at um, the dairy industry there and the impact loss of social license has had on it um, around sustainability. And so we want to make sure that we can foresee some of those and make sure that we maintain social license in the primary sectors um, for the future. Now, as well as these general trends, of course, we um, we've are in the middle of a pandemic. We're still in the middle of a pandemic with um, 
COVID-19 sitting on our borders every day while we might have think we're at, um, uh, we might be uh, coming through this pandemic from where we sit we certainly are not um, uh, it's raging out there with the highest numbers of infected people um, uh, day by day on the planet um, so uh, so that's going to have dramatic effects on agriculture and food. It's done some positive things for the food sector and that it's highlighted the importance of food because one thing that um, uh, we can't stop doing is eating. Um, so that has meant that all the supply chains around food have had to be held open. Um, countries have suddenly got very cognizant of food security and I think that's going to um, awaken many sleeping giants around the issue of food security um, for the future. Food safety, of course, uh, the COVID-19 was associated with um, being um, coming out of a food market. Um, whether, whether the evidence supports that in the end doesn't really matter because I think for most people it's, it's already been associated with food markets, so food safety will be a concern. Um, uh, we'll also foods that can maybe boost the immune system, maybe can uh, increase our well-being, um, and to help us fight COVID um, uh, at the um, uh, at the health level, I think are going to be um, uh, I see some uh, boost. Uh, we've already seen that the sales of some uh, fruit that are associated with high levels of vitamin C are seeing um, a growth in sales internationally, especially in countries that have um, high level high numbers of COVID nineteen patients um, or incidence of the disease. There, the um, also we'll probably get higher. Uh, accelerated rise of um, e-commerce or use of e-commerce in the future. I think every, over lockdown, everyone's got very used to purchasing using e-commerce channels and there's plenty of ways that you can purchase your food through e-commerce. So we might see a, a, a rapid increase in the use of that channel. Um, uh, just like keeping out uh, biosecurity pests and diseases, um, COVID-19, we're also trying to keep out of our border. So this might, um, uh, uh, increase awareness around biosecurity, um, the advent of this pandemic. Certainly we are not seeing uh, the pedal come off the metal uh, around um, sustainability and that certainly will remain as a, um, a major trend in agri-foods. Uh, COVID-19 has also impacted the uh, movement of people around the planet and that has impacts on our ability to access labour, uh, not just for New Zealand but for many countries as well where people move around to work in different parts of the primary sector. So we, that's going to impact um, primary sector quite a bit. And also um, we'll probably see uh, tighter trading blocks formed and people want, uh, countries will want to assure themselves of food security and they they might want to draw some of those um, uh, uh, food sources closer to their borders if not inside their borders uh, if they can to make sure they have enough food for their people um, in the future. Okay so those are, those are some of the trends. Now I want to just talk a little bit about plant and food about what we do. So uh, Plant and Food is uh, research as a Crown Research Institute. Um, so we're a research provider. We believe science um, can deliver a smart green future and make the world a better place through doing that. It's smart because we use innovation technology to create optimized food production systems that offer high tech jobs. It's green because it protects our environment, better use of land, water, technology to promote healthy food and future because what we do um, plays out uh, uh, in the future and offers health prosperity and opportunity for all. We run a, um, uh, a philosophy where we look to invest to create world-class science, we apply that science to create maximum value and then share that value fairly with all those who contributed to its creation to increase sustainably the sustainability of their businesses. So we kind of have this invest, apply, share uh, philosophy in everything that we do. We are spread out across um, a number of locations uh, in New Zealand uh, and also in Australia and the US. Um, we have a major presence um, down on Lincoln, on the uh, down at Lincoln there and our second biggest site after our Auckland site from where I'm broadcasting today. Um, we have city sites but we also have um, regional sites associated with many of the crops that we serve. 
Um, so we have sites in Tipuki for kiwi fruit, uh, sites in Hawke's Bay, um, where we do most of our apple research and our apple breeding programmers. We have um, uh, black currants and berries, um, uh, mainly out of our uh, Hawke's Bay and Motueka sites, stone fruit out of Clyde and um, avocados um, uh, from a number of our different sites, potatoes in Lincoln and um, Fukikoi, uh, and arable down in, in Lincoln, grapes in Marlborough. Uh, we have our seafood site um, in Nelson and we, and we produce a lot of uh, uh, value-add food is mainly out of our Palmerston North site. So you can see all the sectors that we serve and we're very fortunate that we have a lot of the health halo foods, plant-based foods and seafood uh, within our portfolio. This is the way we currently structure our science capabilities. So we have a very large em uh, emphasis on uh, breeding new cultivars. Uh, you'll probably know some of our cultivars, apple, kiwi fruit cultivars, berry, potato, uh, wheat cultivars. Um, we then um, have a large bioprotection capability that's um, uh, tasked with looking to protect those, um, those crops from pest and disease using the lightest touch possible, hopefully residue free, increasingly um, using biocontrol. Sustainable production uh, looks at new uh, food production systems, um, make sure that they're, they're truly sustainable, um, looks at water, soils, um, uh, climate change modelling um, uh, in there as well. Um, we have a lot of our data science sitting in sustainable production. Food innovation um, includes everything from post-harvest science through value-add and um, creating um, uh, foods and beverages that are uh, not only good for you, um, but also um, taste good as well. And then seafood technology um, uh, says what it is there, it's, we, um, it's where we do all our seafood based research from everything from developing new harvest technologies through to aquaculture, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So just I want to talk about things that are happening in the here and now in terms of uh, food production. Um, so these are some of the areas that we think, especially given COVID, that we could really help the New Zealand economy push forward with faster um, by trying to help fill the gap that with some of the other sectors that have really been decimated by COVID, like our tourism um, sector. How could we, um, Plant and Food Research and New Zealand, um, grow some of the other parts of our economy? Uh, we think there's huge opportunity in um, high value horticulture. We already have a number of plays in that space with kiwi fruit. But we think there's probably some other areas we could look at. You can see in this uh, fruit bowl here, um, are, are, there, are there more tropicals? Are there, um, uh, are there other nut crops? Are there other things that we could try in some of the different regions, say, such as tropicals and subtropicals in Northland? Um, are there nuts that we could grow on the Canterbury Plains or Southland um, uh, to to help with um, uh, di diversify our portfolio in this high value horticulture space and produce another five or ten one billion dollar industries. So I think this is a big opportunity for New Zealand. We've already seen the rapid growth of the kiwi fruit industry, but I think there's quite a few opportunities to think of other other crops, uh, high value crops that we could really um, really push on with now, especially as we look at sort of some other options for land use moving forward. The other major opportunity for us is to move up the value chain. Are there um, value add products? And here's an example here. Here's a, um, uh, here's a product, a, a supplement product made from hop, from a hop extract um, that uh, is, um, is a satiety based product that makes you feel fuller for longer and increases the time till you have your next meal. Um, so this is a very high value um, product and products like it, um, I think could uh, move us uh, move us up the value chain so that we don't get caught in the commodity trap. Um, we're only a small country, we can only produce so much of these, um, of these foods and so we really need them to be as high value as possible. Of course sustainability, um, as I said, was the number one trend and we're going to see a lot of emphasis on um, helping growers in all sorts of sectors farm within limits that are increasingly going to be set by the regulators. Um, so here's um, Hamish Brown here um, uh, with his uh, lysimeter and this, this um, measures um, the uh, different kinds of inputs, nitrogen and things, uh, 
and other inputs and how they move down the um, the soil pan given different types of soil and different different amount of water coming into the top and we can we can study uh, these uh, the flow of the nutrients through soils using these sorts of uh, technologies we can look at different soil types and we can even look at different plants that might be able to uh, to help take up some of these nutrients at, at, at different uh, levels in the soil pan so so definitely um, sustainability issues are big. Climate change is also going to be a huge one. As I said before, we're already seeing the effects of climate change. Uh, um, I'm sitting in the middle of a, um, a drought in Auckland at the moment where we're on um, severe water regulations. And here's some of our equipment. We used to have a look at how crops uh, respond to um, different levels of water and temperature. Um, uh, under different climate change scenarios. Uh, we also have modelling capability that runs the, the tape forward, if you like, and has a look across New Zealand uh, soils and uh, different areas and asks the question what different crops might we be able to grow under different climate change scenarios in the future. And this is happening right now as we start making different land use change uh, decisions. We need to uh, be asking, well, look, are we going to be able to grow this crop here in 5, 10 or 20 years time? Digital agriculture is starting to come to New Zealand. We're already, um, we've already hosted Google who, uh, who, who think they can help us in this sort of space. There's plenty of companies uh, who are really pushing hard in the, in the digital area. Um, it's, it's soon going to be possible to uh, cover your uh, farm with sensors, collect the data you need, and then, um, and then make management decisions based on the analysis of that data, whether it be by machine learning or by um, uh, other, other kinds of approaches. So uh, this is our food composition database you can see in front of you. We've, um, uh, but you can look up all the different com uh, components within uh, the foods that are available in New Zealand, and we host this database, so we are already part of this kind of digital revolution, and the, the use of digital technology to inform, um, in this case, not only researchers, but also consumers uh, of food in, in New Zealand. As I said, uh, biosecurity threats are not going away. There's huge amounts of effort in um, uh, protecting our borders, and this is one of the main um, threats. This is brown mammary stink bug. That's a huge threat, and our industry is already well onto this, looking at um, uh, how what they would do if it came here. We've already um, uh, pre-prepared um, and uh, helped some of our industries by um, uh, by testing out a a natural enemy which has already been approved pre-approved for release in New Zealand if this pest was to make it here so uh, we can we can be a bit preemptive in this area and um, and we do that by doing a lot of the work offshore um, in places like China where um, where this um, uh, pest is already found and we can even have a look at the impact on on crops that are in New Zealand um, if they're represented in foreign countries like China so that's that's so being prepared is the name of the game when it comes to biosecurity. So what I'd just like to finish off with is is thinking about the future and the far out the next twenty years or so and what might the food production systems of the future look like, and these are all um, uh, uh, food production systems that plant and food research are working on. We think these are going to be um, uh, potential options for New Zealand to look at. They're also, if you like, um, uh, bets that we're placing um, and that we can structure our more fundamental research around to have long these long-term punts. Now, I'm, well, I'm not saying that the that New Zealand's going to be one or other of these um, or adopt one or other of these 100%, but they do give us some focus um, in our research to rally around. And also that some elements of these new production systems we might implement in the shorter term as, as we do the work. So if they're like, they're kind of polarizing um, ways of looking at the um, food production systems of New Zealand that we can um, structure our science around, as I said. So this is, this is kind of in between the here and now and the tomorrow. This is actually a real photograph of, um, uh, from um, 
the harvest, not just this last year, but the harvest before of Apple off one of our new production systems. Um, uh, this is our, what we call our future um, uh, ultra production system. Uh, you can see that it's planar and the apples are two-dimensional on a two-dimensional array. Uh, the rows are very close together. We can only just get this, um, uh, this robot down between the rows and this is a robotic harvester system. This production system uh, produces almost twice as much in terms of kilos of apple as conventional production systems because more of the plant's leaves have access to light. Um, so we've maximized photosynthesis opportunity here um, and that's um, uh, borne out in increased production per hectare and of course narrowing up the rows as well enhances that production. So it's up to about, a, we think it's about 180 uh, tons per hectare production of apples. And not only is it increasing production, it's also paving the way for robotic uh, robotics as well. So it makes it easier for um, uh, conventional um, labor uh, picking, but also the robots can access the apples much more easily. So, uh, and we can also put sensors down these, these rows as well. So we're kind of setting up our production systems to be technology ready for the future. The big leap, I think, in transformation systems will come when we can actually start thinking um, about the what if without actually having to build the production system itself. Many industries already do this. Here's a, I've got a, uh, an illustration here from aircraft uh, manufacturer industry where they uh, basically do this by designing and um, a new plane completely in silico. So essentially a computer model of a plane, which they can fly virtually as a computer model and see how it flies. They can look at the passenger experience in the plane. They can look at the stress levels along the wings, the tail. They can do anything you can norm, uh, do with a normal uh, real model, um, but they can do it all in silico. Currently, we don't have the ability to do that with our um, food production systems. Essentially, we can do bits of the modeling, um, and, but we can't model the entire system. Um, we essentially have to try it out. And uh, so wouldn't it be fantastic if we could um, uh, develop systems where we try to optimize um, uh, them for various characteristics? It might be minimizing labor, it might be uh, minimizing spray inputs, it might be looking at different climate change scenarios. And we looked at the Optimum, optimal food production system at the um, uh, at the at, at center of that network of all the things that you'd want to optimize. So we have a we're just developing a digital twin program where we're trying to pull together all the models of a food production system. So the model of the plant itself, the soils, how it interacts with other uh, organisms, the inputs required, um, uh, and and the production uh, levels itself um, to actually be able to do this uh, whole design work in silico. So it's going to be um, quite a long program to, to get there, but I think it's going to uh, help us make big leaps in the design of our food production systems. The other big leap we're looking for is a complete change in philosophy around our food systems. So currently our food systems are designed to just do what's written on the tin, which is produce food. But shouldn't we demand more of our food systems than that? Um, at the moment, we allow food systems that produce food, but at some cost to, um, I would argue, the environment, and then we tolerate certain levels of that cost. Wouldn't it be nice if we had food production systems that actually gave back to people in place, that actually enhanced communities by providing the jobs that we want um, in our communities that were better for the environment, that increased biodiversity, created carbon, fixed carbon, um, uh, and, uh, and purified water. So I think if we can turn this on its head, we're going to make some real strides in developing uh, new food production systems for New Zealand. The other big advantage we have in, in New Zealand is our story of uh, the people and our um, uh, and place. So uh, Te Tangata and Whenua, we have unique stories no one else has in the world and if we can link those stories up to the consumers um, uh, through technology, we have a real advantage around our provenance. Uh, 
um, from New Zealand. We've seen, we are increasingly seeing that. If we can do that in a, a using technology to enhance that, I think we can really add some value to our food systems. How about technology? Certainly we are starting to see an increase in interest around urban farming, particular, uh, particular in Asia, but also in other parts of the world. This is actually a shot of, um, uh, uh, from the company premises of a company called Growing Underground in London, um, in an old bomb shelter. Um, they are producing um, some leafy greens um, here. Um, and we think that increasingly that as food security becomes an issue, the large cities in the world are going to want to make sure that an increasing proportion of their food can be grown within the city. Um, uh, and COVID 19's only um, made that uh, uh, more of an imperative than ever. Um, we see a huge opportunity for New Zealand in being able to supply the um, crops and and the growing systems for non-leafy greens and so that might be fruit and uh, might be uh, horticultural crops that uh, that currently can't be grown in these systems because of their size and stature and architecture um, the fact that they um, are tied to seasonality so if we can decouple them or produce cultivars that can flower continuously us uh, have a uh, squat in nature are uh, highly branched all of those kind of characteristics that can go into these systems, we think that we can start to think about a kind of a part of New Zealand in a box that we can market and into these, uh, into the foreign cities in the world so that they can enjoy part of New Zealand, but um, uh, within their own city. So we think we've got a big opportunity there um, as one of these punts that I was talking about earlier for uh, where food production might go. And finally, another place where food production is likely to increasingly go is out into the ocean. Um, currently, um, we largely harvest the ocean, um, but increasingly there's uh, thinking of uh, moving our production for seafood out into the ocean. Norway are using an approach here, um, using their expertise in heavy engineering with all their oil rig technology um, and looking at taking massive aquaculture structures out into the open ocean. We think there's an opportunity for New Zealand in this space too, but perhaps not taking the, uh, an engineering approach like that, but more of a soft structure approach. And this is leveraging off our um, a precision seafood harvesting technology uh, to look at soft structures that we might be more readily able to move around. We're thinking about more mobile structures out into the ocean uh, where we could um, uh, deploy aquaculture, uh, move them around. Uh, we're very interested in looking at the sustainability as well as the technology, the sustainability, the cultural and social license of some of these technologies for New Zealand going forward. So I'll leave it there and just a final um, uh, a few um, a few messages. Um, we think that there's uh, we should be looking at the near in and the long term in our food production systems for transformation opportunities. Um, uh, some of these opportunities such as uh, urban farming we might be able to apply some gene technologies to and we still think that they um, our role is to produce some of these um, gene technology options um, for New Zealand industries, up to them whether they want to choose them to deploy those technologies or not, but we've, our role is to, um, is to provide those options. Um, and, and we also think that, uh, that the technology in itself is important and innovation is important to bring to these food production systems as options generally. Okay, I think I'll leave it there and open it up for questions. Thank you so much for that, Richard. Um, hopefully um, we're all back on. Excellent. Okay, so um, first of all, I just wanted to say amazing presentation and thank you so much for, for coming along in the first instance. Um, of particular, um, I guess, uh, particular importance to me was around the, the provenance stuff that you were saying. Um, and I think whilst provenance, um, there's a lot of focus on that at the moment. It's not used necessarily to market the New Zealand story. And I think in the time that we are in currently, that's becoming more and more important. Would you agree with that? 
Absolutely. I think um, New Zealand's got such a, um, uh, it's got a great story overall. We still can ride on the clean green image. Um, we're COVID free. So there's that kind of almost uh, implicit health halo as well that comes with being COVID free that we could really play on. So no, I think we're, we're in a great spot. And uh, if we can maintain those supply chains into, into those countries that hopefully i think the the biggest issue i think in the short term for us would be the it's going to be the ability of those countries um or the, the consumers to pay so as those other countries go into recession um maybe their focus is going to actually move to um to cost effective foods rather than premium foods so it's we'll we'll have to sort of wait and see wait and see on that one um, I would totally agree with that. I've just got a few messages saying that my microphone's a little bit quiet. So hopefully, if I shout a little bit louder, everyone will be able to hear me. Right. Um, the other thing I uh, I did note in that is that you were talking about digital um, agriculture. And at what stage would you say that New Zealand is in terms of adoption of that? Yeah, I mean, we had this debate about whether New Zealand is adopting some of these technologies fast enough. I think we do have some fast adopters in New Zealand of um, precision agriculture, um, uh, but probably the average, on average, we're probably slow at adopting some of these technologies. And I think part of the issue is that we're not, is maybe maybe our growers cannot see the real, where the value is being added by some of these technologies. So maybe we really need to have a, um, we need to do some more work in in making sure these tools are actually adding value for the growers uh, and the consumers if they're depending on where they are in the supply chain um, and and also uh, looking at some of the um, some some of the adoption practices and how we can introduce some of these technologies in, into our production systems and supply chains Brilliant. Um, now, I'm actually, I'm going to go on to the real questions now, rather than my own that I've just written down. Um, <laughs> so that's the benefits of hosting these events, you get your questions answered first. So I've got one here. Uh, how can New Zealand prepare for the shifting global protein demands as the flexitarian diet becomes more mainstream? Mm. Yes, it's interesting. I think um, uh, the, the tough one is that there's different parts of the world are moving into um, uh, into plant-based foods, and other parts of the world are moving are still wanting more meat in their diet. So, and in fact, some of our markets uh, want more seafood probably because uh, some some parts of Asia we've that we've done some work in um, see high health as being. As, as being associated with with seafoods, so I think it, it depends where you are. I mean, we we are feeling in in New Zealand and perhaps part of parts of Europe are seeing the trend towards flexitarian diets, but that's certainly not universal all over the world. So I think having been able to cater to those changing diets and uh, having a whole lot of options where we can go into different markets is is going to be essential. Brilliant. We've got another question here. Uh, Looks like it's had a few upvotes actually. You mentioned a vision for food systems that give back by providing jobs, but increasing automation such as robots harvesting apples will create significant disruption to the workforce. Any thoughts on how we might be able to strike a balance on that? Yeah, it's really interesting. That's it's a good one. We often debate that as well. Um, I think it's about the types of jobs and certainly um, uh, uh, so even robots need someone to program them, need someone to maintain them, needs. Uh, so it's it's again it's about it's about the, the types of jobs. While we might not need as many um, people um, hand picking with robotics, um, we're still going to need um, still going we're going to need people to program them. So I think the and getting across to people that um, that work in that technology space and the IT space that actually have we got a deal for you and you can actually work in our sector is um, I don't think we're getting our message across that there are plenty of opportunities in, in the agricultural space for those kinds of high tech jobs. Um, on the other side of it, in the short term, um, uh, we're going to see a lot more New Zealanders working in horticulture with the borders closed. Um, so, uh, so yes, and and, uh, and so in the short term, I think we are going to see um, uh, more New Zealanders contributing to um, 
to be getting hands on in, in the horticultural industry and dairy industry? I think you're absolutely right there. There is a balance, isn't there? Because bees are, are people are very differently skilled to one another, perhaps. Um, and is the volume of jobs going to be the same? Probably not. So I think that there's a, a little um, seesaw balancing act that needs to be done there, isn't there? I think so. And there also needs to be some uh, uh, perhaps skill change, some more planning. Uh, we need to think about whether our kind of uh, courses were uh, for politics and agriculture and horticulture have enough IT exposure in them, all those sorts of issues. Mm, mm. Um, I've got another one here, another uh, one with a lot of upvotes. Do you think we need a national food strategy? <laughs> So there is, um, there is uh, we're just halfway through the development of an agri-tech strategy and the MPI is just about to kick off a food strategy piece of work. So uh, uh, yes, I think, um, and we're contributing into that. So I think having a, a total food strategy would be quite useful, absolutely. Cool. Uh, high value crops are currently transported by air. Are you also looking at high value crops that can be transported with low impact transport? Yeah, so um, uh, this, there are still a few crops that are moved around by air, cherries, um, crayfish. Uh, um, we do spend quite a bit of uh, time in terms of research looking at ways that we can convert those into uh, uh, sea freight. Um, and uh, I think that's there are some opportunities to do that. But I think people would be surprised how much of our produce actually goes by ship, most of it goes um, goes by ship and while they're certainly at the moment um, the ships uh, do burn carbon um, uh, it's per kilo of um, of uh, produce it's not too bad but also I think there's an opportunity to um, for battery powered ships in the future to eliminate that totally. Mm. That, that does come as a surprise I think to a number of our uh, participants here that there is still in uh, the majority of our produce going by ship. So I think um, that's, that is very interesting. Um, I've got another question here. Are your new development crops climate ready or will they be putting more stress on soils and water? Um, yeah, I think there's opportunities for us to look at um, things completely out of the box, being climate ready um, by looking at um, uh, tropicals, subtropicals and crops that have low water input uh, into them. So yeah, we don't want to, uh, um, you know, basically create a, a, another problem for ourselves by um, either planting a crop that's only going to be able to be grown in that area for a few years and then all of a sudden there's not enough winter chill or etc. Uh, or they the water needs um, uh, are too great. So yes, we're going to have to make some smart decisions there. And I think that's where the modeling comes in. We're gonna be able to, with some of the tools that we have, we're gonna be able to model way out into the future in terms of water needs, um, temperature, um, et cetera, and have a look to see how long we've got for some of these crops. I mean, it's pretty alarming already for some of our existing crops and our existing places where they're grown. I mean, we're not gonna be able to uh, grow some of the, uh, the horticultural crops that we've got where they are for, um, for a lot longer. Uh, I've got another question here. Uh, will GMO help us with droughts? What do you think about social acceptance of GMO? Uh, will politics follow? I think this is a major question um, that I uh, that we've been discussing in the office a lot lately. So it'd be interesting to hear your take on this one. Yeah, well, politicians won't move very far from their constituency. So uh, totally, um, it will be what the constituency thinks, or at least what the politicians think the constituency thinks. Um, and they often use polling and other things to decide that. And I think at the moment, GMOs are too close to the 50-50 for any political party to take a punt on it. Uh, it's more in the runaway, too difficult um, uh, too difficult. I th m my impression would be it would need uh, it would need a burning platform. It would need a crisis where there was only one solution, and that was a GMO for GMOs probably to get over the line at the moment. There's also a feeling that we might be trading off a GMO-free ticket um, that we kind of have by just the fact that our legislation makes it very difficult to get GMOs over the line, and 
So we, um, there's various debates about how much we're trading off that GE free position. Yeah, um, that is very interesting. And I think that was sort of the result that we were, we were sort of saying there would have to be an absolute crisis with GMO being the only um, available option that that would be, I think, the only avenue that where it would become acceptable. And, and it, I mean, from our discussion, but who knows? I'm not a politician. And maybe there's a good reason for that one. Um, <laughs> uh, so we've got a, a question here from Jane Montgomery. How would you propose to have a discussion re uh, CRI SPR with the general public in New Zealand? Oh. Yeah, I'm, we're debating that at the moment. I, th I think um, the technology we're using tonight um, um, offers the ability to actually open up a bit more than we have um, because of the cost of participating. Well, you know, you get in your car and go somewhere to, to a debate or something. It's literally, you can just hook in from home. I mean, I'm hoping that, you know, that we can have these debates and include more people. And if with some of these technologies, reducing the barrier to participate. But um, yeah, um, I don't have any uh, fantastic ideas on, on on how we can get more, um, but we I think we're going to have to because uh, because social license is going to become increasingly important. I mean, the fact that we're using, if you like, in the primary sector, we're using New Zealand um, to grow things and then ship them mainly to be consumed by non-New Zealanders. And the only, and we, we've got to be very cognizant of the benefits that flow back to New Zealand to be able to balance that. Uh, uh, and we have to be able to communicate what are the benefits that we're bringing back to New Zealand. And not, it, it can't just be money either. It has to be um, bigger, more um, broader benefits than that across society uh, to justify our, our use of New Zealand's precious resources. And that's why I think part of the answer is we actually have food systems that give back because that will generate social license for us. So that will be a very important part of that whole, it will actually create people, communities that want to get into food production because they are not just seeing the fiscal benefits, but also the benefits to their community and to the environment. And I don't think we're there yet. That was um, exactly what was going through my head was that slide that you had up um, in terms of enhancing communities um, rather than just being an environmental cost. So I think that definitely comes back to that one there. Um, we've got another question here. I like the Māori link it is, as it is really unique. Are there old crops, I've got in quotation marks, or old breeds that we could market? Yeah, um, that's a really interesting question. One's, uh, the, we think about that often within plant and food and um, and we have lots of conversations with uh, uh, with some of our, um, our Maori experts that we we link to around traditional foods um, that we could look at um, uh, to take into commercial production. Um, there's a couple of things um, to note there. Or the, probably the most important is that we haven't settled um, the Waitangi Tribunal uh, uh, 262 yet, and we need. Um, not only resolve to resolve that, but also look at new kind of commercial um, business models that would acknowledge and uh, uh, the the customary ownership and rights of Maori around traditional food use, and ensure um, and rather than some of the more Western uh, business models, which which talk about ownership and uh, and so, because uh, they're not really compatible with some of some of the, um, the the notions of traditional use, so we're actually very interested to do quite a bit of work in that space to see if we can find the right kind of business models that would suit everyone, uh, and especially Maori, so that we could actually start to move forward and commercialise with Maori, or even preferably by Maori, um, uh, and to create a more diverse set of food systems for New Zealand and also to, that would have an even more enhanced provenance story. To be quite frank, I'm a little bit ashamed that most of our product, food production systems in New Zealand have at the centre of them um, plants and animals that are not from here. So that creates, that would be the ultimate provenance story for me would be to have uh, 
food that came from here it was not only about the land and the and the and the people but it was about the crop itself as well excellent um i've got a question here from dean uh who asks value um value add seems to be a synonym for plastic add a lot of the time are you looking at ways to minimize that and are there opportunities for ag co-products to replace old packaging tech Completely. Yeah, 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 exactly. I think you're right. A lot of um, value add isn't actually value add. It's just um, uh, branding and plastic. Um, uh, uh, I think there is a lot of opportunity to look for um, new sustainable um, packaging materials uh, we've developed some uh, with some of our partners um, uh, using some of their waste streams to make packaging for their um, uh, for for their different foods so we act, are actively involved in that we have a materials group uh, down in Lincoln and uh, there's also Scion research have a, a large materials group as well also looking at um, circular economy approaches and development of um, biomaterials that could be used as packaging. And how would you say that New Zealand compares um, in terms of a sustainable packaging approach? Poorly I'd say. Um, uh, and the, the other challenge that we've got is some of the markets that we um, sell into associate packaging with food safety and I think there's quite a bit of cultural change as well it's going to be quite challenging for us to to get over that um, but I think we've got a fair way to go yet yeah uh, another question here from Matthew Watson I'm interested in your thoughts on food preservation the current system is far too dependent on refrigeration Yes, we've just started up a program in that space. Um, uh, uh, another one of our programs where we have the goal of trying to um, uh, develop systems where we can store food at ambient temperatures. I agree with you, refrigeration is, um, uh, well, it's a, it's a problem in some ways in that um, uh, currently, mo uh, you know, for, that a lot of that's going to burn diesel to keep it refrigerated while it's being shipped. So if we can find either, um, our, while some of that's going to be ameliorated by the fact that a lot of, if we move to battery uh, and green energy, then uh, some of that will be ameliorated. But the easiest way to do that would be for us. The things, the, the contribution we could make was to develop foods that didn't need low temperature storage at all. So we've started to think about that and we think that that would be a huge stretch for many of our products, but it's a worthy target. Uh, I think that's fantastic. Ooh, let me grab that. I think that's fantastic. Now I've got a question uh, from someone who wants to ask the question themselves. So I'm going to just pass you over to Sonia here, who's got a question. Uh, over to you, Sonia. Are you there, Sonia? No? Okay. Maybe you have a question. She's on mute, I think. Oh, no. I've, oh, I've unmuted her. Maybe I think she's disappeared. Um, that's okay. Her question must have been wildly pressing. Um, <laughs> onto the, I'm sure she'll um, put it through on chat. Uh, I've got another question here. Should we create one green New Zealand brand for all of our crops? Yeah, I mean, Ireland have successfully done that, um, created a, a green brand, and there has been talk about whether New Zealand could do that as well. I think we kind of have, almost have an implicit brand that sits inside New Zealand, the word New Zealand itself. Um, so I wonder whether we need to do that or whether New Zealand itself, because of the various images that it conjures up, brings that with its with the name. But that's a good point. It looks like we've got Sonia back here. Uh, let me just unmute her there. Sonia, if you just unmute yourself, you'll be able to uh, talk. I've got you there. No, it looks like, oh, we're having a bit of an issue there. That's okay, we'll come back to you, Sonia. Uh, the next one, is PFR doing research into alternative protein crop production here in New Zealand. I'm going to take PFR as plant food research. Yes. <laughs> so what's the question again? Uh, doing research um, into... So they're doing into research into alternative protein or crop production here in New Zealand. 
Yeah, we're doing some work in alternative proteins and we have uh, interacted with others that are looking to push forward in this, um, in this space. Uh, we've done some work on um, uh, looking at how we could use um, uh, some waste streams, um, plant-based waste streams across into food. We've looked at um, some of the plant-based milks and done some work in that space with customers. Um, so yes, we are quite quite involved in that space and that's definitely something that's in the here and now. Where I'm um, uh, uh, quite interested to see where New Zealand can contribute in the plant-based food space that doesn't drop to commodity. So is there a value add proposition? Because uh, you'd have to argue that um, uh, fresh, fresh fruit and vegetables is actually the value add position in, in plant-based foods currently. So whereas the what people normally talk about, uh, or people are referring to in the plant-based foods trend is looking for meats is meat substitutes that are made from plants and that usually involves quite a bit of processing so uh, and often that it drops to commodity so is there some sort of value add play that we can make um, or help in, uh, uh, be associated with New Zealand in that in that space that's a good question I think it's still open uh, we've got another one here from Alan Maine New Zealand converted an unknown Chinese gooseberry into a global barnstorm, kiwi fruit. There are many fruits with local domain in limited parts of the world that could be similar, similarly or launched to the world. Uh, tamarula, uh, tamarillo, fajoa. Uh, what prospects for other kiwi fruit um, form New Zealand, would you say? Yeah, I think the big opportunity for us in kiwi fruit is the fact that we can take um, a, a, a the Chinese gooseberry and turn it into a whole range of different um, cultivars just like apple or any a lot of other fruit have have a whole range of cultivars and we could basically produce that whole range and create a whole new category of fruit called kiwi fruit that includes big small red green um, yellow a whole range of things so I agree there's opportunities for us to do that there we and and as I said before I think we need to start looking at uh, some another five or ten kiwi fruit like sectors that we could set up um, that would also be high value. So maybe it is Fijoa, maybe it is Tamarillo, maybe there's quite a few others that we could look at. Um, the big, the thing that made kiwi fruit work for us was the fact that we worked out how to store it to get it to market. Um, uh, we need to be able to do that. It's not just something that tastes good and unique and fabulous and the provenance story is good, but it's also it's also actually getting it to market. And where a lot of these other crops like Fijos have fallen over in the past is 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 being able to store it and get it to market. Now, and if, and if one of our other uh, 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 audience members put the challenge up of getting that there without refrigeration, well, that's even going to be harder for some of these crops. We can barely get them there with refrigeration, never mind without. Um, and I'll tell you um, a, a little bit about that Fijoa story as well. Um, I, I have recently returned from London uh, where I used to enjoy the borough markets on a, on a Saturday morning and there's nothing worse than paying one pound per Fijoa <laughs> only to find that they're only subpar as well when you can yeah. get a a bag for free from your local colleague in New Zealand. <laughs> so that is a challenge that I'm putting out to the public. Um, there's huge demand, huge. No one quite understands the fajoa like we do. Um, another question here. Uh, do you see a future for vertical farming? Yeah, I, th I think that we will see some of the mega cities that evolve over the next 10 years really put quite a bit of investment into vertical farms. And the reason is not because necessarily because it's sustainable technology or that it reduces air miles of their food, but more to give them for two reasons. One, to give them the assurance of food supply and though cities will do anything they can to assure food supply. The other one is to actually reconnect people with food production because there's one thing we're seeing is a real um, uh, start, starting to evolve is the city rural divide and by moving food production into the cities will start to break down that divide, I think. Um, there's a, a question from um, Christian uh, who has come through that sort of leads, leads on from that a bit. When it comes to vertical agriculture, 
How feasible is it really considering the current cost benefit analysis show it's not that profitable? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, so obviously the big cost at the moment is energy. Um, it's also for a lot of countries, it's not particularly uh, green energy. We're lucky in New Zealand that while it still costs a lot, it's reasonably green with 70% of our power being produced out of hydro. So yes, it's a, it's a big challenge. Um, but then again, it depends what you care more about because some of the vertical farming systems um, are far more water efficient because they can recycle all the water. Um, whereas, um, so it depends how much you put uh, a cost on water. If, uh, currently, water is valued at, you know, um, maybe it's under under costed at the moment um, with in New Zealand or the, so it all depends because uh, it's not really a level playing field for a lot of these inputs um, that that we're talking about. Um, so uh, I think if we can work out ways of looking at the real costs and the real value uh, um, that rather than just simple fiscal ones, um, then we we might see that some of these systems aren't as, um, that do, they, maybe they are competitive. I don't know, I'm just, I'm just putting it out there that um, it depends how you compare them. I mean, for instance, at the moment we're discounting, we're discounting all of the um, pollutants that we use for outdoor production systems. So we're discounting the environment. We don't include that in the real cost. Um, here's a, a good question that sort of comes on from that one as well, I guess. Um, so it's clear, um, so this is from an anonymous attendee, it's clear plant and food research um, are developing a lot of useful information for land use um, planning purposes, i.e. you mentioned climate scenario based work. How does this information actually get communicated or transmitted to the level of the person on the ground making the crop selection decisions? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, um, and the, the, one of the challenges is that um, it brings together data held by various agencies. Um, Anaki Whenua hold the soil data, Niwa holds the weather data, we hold some of the plant models uh, data. So, um, uh, and um, so it, it actually pulling that all together and putting it in a form that's easily accessible um, is, uh, is, is quite tricky and there, but there, I can say that um, that one way you can do it is you can talk directly to us to get that information and we can do some modeling for you. But we hope that in the future, I know there are companies that are setting up to, to basically provide that service um, to third parties. Uh, another question here from Mariana. How can farmers gain more control over the supply chain? <laughs> oh, yes. Um, I think that's a tricky one for growers because, as everyone knows, um, the uh, more value is added as you move further up the supply chain, whether that's real or perceived. And we've thought long and hard about how we can make sure that with innovation we can share the benefits that we create through um, that knowledge and technology um, uh, right through through the value chain, including right back down to the growers. And for many growers, they are, um, they might be uh, involved in co-ops that actually funded the research in the first place. So um, I think it's a, I think where the question's coming from is more about how we can make sure that the value share is equi equitable right across the value chain. And yeah, that's something that we're very uh, interested in making sure happens um, that we do get that equity across the value chain. And I don't think this, I don't think purchasing upwards is necessarily the answer. Uh, I've got a question here from Alex, who uh, looks to be trying to solve my Fajoa and Borough Markets dilemma here. Uh, so he said, as sea freight is still the main method for New Zealand producers' export, is delayed ripening technology a uh, promising approach to reduce the loss due to long shipment? Uh, yes. <laughs> That's the short answer. Um, uh, and that will probably be the... Um, one of the main approaches that uh, the research team will use, understanding the ripening process. I mean, uh, if we could turn everything into a banana where it's picked green and then exposed to ethylene two or three days out from port to, to get it to a stage where it's ready for sale, um, uh, I think we'd, be, um, we'd make a lot of people very happy. Mm. Yeah. Um, we've got uh, an, an anonymous uh, question here. 
Should we shift our dairy farmland over to horticultural production? Yeah, this is an interesting debate. Um, uh, uh, we got asked the same question by the Climate Change Commission. Um, the uh, and the the short well, there's no short answer. It's a complicated answer because um, uh, there's a very for many of our industries, there's a very delicate supply demand balance. So we can't just you know double the size of the kiwi fruit industry because um, we'd have to then work out where we're going to sell the rest of that crop. Um, and what markets would we sell it to and would we end up dumping half of it and actually destroying the value um, and, the, and the price for the, for the whole crop. So um, we've only got to remember the wine glut of a few years ago to, to understand how delicate that supply demand balance can be. So uh, if we can build um, growth into markets and new markets um, slowly and sustainably, then yes, we can increase um, production and we could look at changing land use balance but uh, we just have to be quite careful um, uh, it's also I think I think we're really rather than just talking about replacing dairy with horticulture I think we actually have to stand back and have a, um, a serious look at all of our land use and start to ask a question what's the most appropriate way to use this land and maybe have that being a bit more dominant in the debate um, about what that land actually ends up being used for rather than just having market forces with a bit of regulation around the edge um, dictating land use. Which I guess leads us actually quite nicely into the next question we've got here from uh, Constantin. Uh, Constantin says, our dairy cattle productivity is significantly lower than in other Western countries. Um, do you think raising productivity of cows is a solution for lowering the, the greenhouse gas footprint? Yeah, this is probably not my, um, uh, this is probably not my area of expertise, but are the, um, I think we've got to be a bit careful when we look compare dairy across countries because there is quite different um, dairy practices across different countries and where we use a pasture-based system whereas a lot of other countries don't and so they they their systems might look more efficient depending on whether you're comparing the um, cows per hectare or uh, uh, the whole way our pasture-based system was designed was it was designed to be very low input and cheap and have the cows outside um, whereas most other systems uh, are not like that. So I'd probably have to look at the detail and see whether we were comparing apples with apples or not. Mm -hmm. um, we've got, well, speaking of apples, actually, that's a good segue. Um, so I've got a question here. We've done a good job with the new apple varieties over the last 20 years. Is there much space left to innovate with apples? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I think that's uh, that's a question we ask ourselves all the time. You know, where is the what's what's a novel apple look like? I mean, there's there's apples for uh, there's apples all over the place, um, uh, and the market is quite um, a uh, quite flooded with different apple varieties. We have um, uh, through uh, some fantastic breeding managed to always be at the top of the heap when it comes to apples. Our cultivars always do the best, have the greatest returns, get voted the best apple. But can we keep doing that? And to keep doing that, we have to keep thinking about what does innovation look like with apples? Um, uh, is it, is it, um, is it red fleshed? Would it be a completely sustainable apple that wouldn't require any uh, pesticide inputs? Would the consumer be willing to pay more for an apple where we could prove that it had lower inputs than everything else? What, what kind of traits would actually we should be pushing out and uh, to create that differentiation to that whole vast sea of apple cultivars that are out there? Cool, and uh, we'll just finish up with a few more questions. So if you've got something really pressing, um, that you are wanting to ask Dr. Richard Newcomb, please pop it in the Q&A. So I'll just um, start wrapping up. So we've got May C asks, is it possible to produce dairy or dairy products in the lab? Yes, there is a UK based startup company that is looking at uh, producing synthetic milk from cultured human uh, uh, lactating cells. Um, uh, to produce synthetic uh, 
human milk for for mothers that uh, are unable to produce milk themselves. So um, uh, presumably you could probably do that with um, uh, with with uh, cells and of the lactation from cows if you wanted to, but certainly the high value end of that would be human milk for humans. So yes, people are thinking about that. There's also lots of plant-based milk plays as well. I think milk is one of these areas where um, there's quite a bit of disruption coming at it. Um, uh, and it's kind of a watch this space. It's gonna be very interesting where, you know, whether we're going to be drinking milk from cows as the standard kind of milk in the future or what the standard kind of milk look like. Mm. Uh, we've got a question here from Peter Bull, who uh, says, plant and food work with New Zealand partners to deliver your smart technologies overseas, uh, e.g. Sun Gold with Zespri. This grows the market for new New Zealand foods and production technologies. Could we do more of this? Um, yes, we could, and um, we do that to uh, create uh, all rounds uh, or year round supply. Um, so we work with our partners to to uh, and also to provide near to market options for supply as well. So yes, absolutely, we could do more of that, and and we are where we can uh, working with our New Zealand partners to sort of uh, diversify. And 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 what's really important there is is the is that we have a partner who's willing to uh, to do this, such as Zespri, also that we have the, the uh, in this case, the PBR kind of all wrapped up and that we can, and also we, we supply the knowledge of how to produce and that we can take um, to those other countries. Brilliant, and uh, just one last question we've got here from uh, Jane Montgomery. One of the biggest issues facing New Zealand ag today is biogenic methane. What insights can you offer from your perspective as a means of addressing this issue? <laughs> yeah, again, this is not something that plant and food are working on, but I know that um, Greenhouse Gas Mission and, uh, 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 and Ag Research are working on this. I guess there's a couple of different approaches that are being taken. One is a, um, uh, can we inhibit the, the methanogenic um, bacteria that live in the cow's guts? And there are approaches to look at a chemical intervention there that would inhibit the enzymes involved in the the methane and there's there's some progress in that area. Uh, another option is to look at foods to give cows that um, uh, can change the composition of the microbiome of the of the cow so that the, the methanogens um, don't do so well and there's projects currently looking at various seaweeds added to um, diets of cows to reduce the amount of methane produced from them. So I think there's quite a few different approaches that we're taking um, to try and reduce uh, methane production by cows and, and sheep. So um, hopefully we'll have some solutions in that area so that we can. I mean, I think we still, we would be crazy not to have an animal-based uh, sectors in New Zealand. Um, so if we can find ways to reduce that methane production, I think we can, uh, we'll see a long future for our animal industries here. Absolutely, absolutely. Brilliant, well, I guess that wraps up our questions uh, for this afternoon. Thank you so much, Richard, um, for A, your presentation, and B, for staying so long for all of our questions. Um, it's been wonderful hosting you, and I know we've had a lot of requests over the last few months for you to share your expertise. So I'm sure we'll have some really happy audience members uh, going, going home tonight. Now, just before we wrap up this afternoon's event, if you haven't heard already, B-Link Innovation in conjunction with Farmers Weekly have launched our inaugural Celebrating Success and Innovation Awards, where we're celebrating on-farm, off-farm, and future tech innovations. Uh, whether you're a farmer with a great idea to improve efficiencies, a producer with a great idea to connect directly with the consumer, or a secondary school student with a fantastic idea around future tech to improve output or efficiencies, we want to hear from you. So uh, visit uh, blinkinnovation.com forward slash celebrating dash success dash innovation dash awards to see uh, what they're all about and enter your application. We've got over $16,000 worth of prizes up for grabs. Um, including some amazing prizes from Lincoln University, our platinum sponsor. So if you have a great idea, um, either you've implemented it or uh, you're thinking about implementing it, now's your opportunity for us to celebrate um, innovation in a, in a time where I think celebration is really necessary. Cool. So, well, that's it from me, everyone. Again, a massive thank you to Dr. Richard Newcomb 
to the rest of the team at Plant and Food Research uh, for your support, the communications team at Lincoln University and the rest of the team here at B-Link. But most of all, thank you for your questions and your participation. I've had a really great time and I hope you have as well. Uh, we're hoping that this will be one of our last virtual only events. With lockdown being lifted, fingers crossed, it stays that way. We're looking forward to everyone coming back into B-Link Workshop for the next five events. We'll promise we'll put on some nice wine, some nice nibbles, and uh, have some really good networking. Uh, if you're interested in keeping up to date with our future events, make sure to subscribe um, to our email comms on the website. We've got, again, some really exciting speakers coming up in the next six weeks. Um, I would really highly recommend uh, signing up to those, just so you keep in the loop. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Richard. I really appreciate you speaking today and answering all of our questions um, and putting up with my Fiji stories. So <laughs> I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming along. Pleasure. Thanks, Julia. Thanks. And thanks, thanks to the audience. Thanks, everyone. See you later. See ya.